while we're um, uh, doing this, Soph, is that I think I'm just trying to admit people while you were talking there, and it seems to be hitting the 300, um, even though we've bought that additional add-on. So you might just want to double check that because there might be people who are getting bounced out and can't join. So can you just double check that that large meeting add-on worked for today's meeting? And yes, it's on the right course. account and stuff. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So it wouldn't be a true Zoom meeting if we didn't have at least some uh, technical joy. Um, other bits of Zoom bingo that I'm fulfilling right now, there is a cat in the room who will join the session periodically and I'm in my slippers um, I hope you are too <laughs> and thank you ever so much for all coming along today we've had a really brilliant response to oh you can't hear me can anyone else not hear me is it just Carol Locke Sophie can you hear me yeah I can hear you okay so in which case you might want to touch in with Carol right I'm going to put the, the, the chat to one side and Sophie will tell me if there's anything I need to see otherwise it will distract me um so yes thank you ever so much for joining us we've had a really really good response on this so we're thinking about um autism in girls why we don't always pick it up how we might go about picking it up and how we can best support um and this is a topic that we've done a little bit of work on some of you might have done our um on-demand training um on autistic masking which Jody Smith and put together for us which is um we'll we'll link through to all this in the notes which sophie will send through to you afterwards um and that's had a, a really good response but we we've had lots and lots of interest around autism generally and um, but autism in girls and this kind of increased understanding that there might be girls that we're missing um and we want to make sure we're not missing them and help them as best we can um i have a vested interest in this because i am on an autistic girl or woman uh, who was missed uh, only diagnosed in my uh, 30s and um, it would have made a big difference uh, to me and my life if I had been recognised sooner. And now that I'm aware of my autism, um, I'm much better able to manage. Um, but just in terms of kind of reassurance and kindness to self, I think uh, a helpful touch point here is that I didn't recognize that I was autistic and it was not suggested to me or recognized in me uh, by others in my life, despite the fact that I had worked um, in an autistic unit and uh, done a lot of work in autism and with autistic people um, across quite a lot of my career. It's been an area of uh, interest. Uh, and yet uh, it never occurred to me that this might have been a, a challenge that I had because it presents so differently. Um, and yes, pretty much whenever I'm researching autism in girls and women, uh, I I tick all those boxes of how brilliantly we tend to hide it um, and the other things that can be challenging for us. So a reassurance that there's quite a lot that we'll cover in this session, but I have written notes um, and also made some suggestions uh, of further reading uh, and resources that you might refer to afterwards. And as Sophie said, the session is recorded should you wish to watch it back. And I will also uh, take the key elements of this and turn it into an on-demand session on our website as well. So the first thing I wanted to think about was just why autism in girls in particular can be so difficult to spot. So we know that, or increasingly we understand that autism in girls is picked up um, on average several months or a year later than in boys statistically, but actually we know kind of anecdotally that it can be years and years and years later. And certainly my story of discovering I'm autistic in my thirties is very, very far from rare. Um, what happens with girls is that when they're young the way that their autism kind of presents and displays tends to mean that they they manage quite well and we'll look at that in a bit more depth um, but they manage quite well um, and it's only really as they get a bit, bit, bit older that it becomes more difficult for them to manage that perhaps the way in which they do manage it becomes less sort of a thing that their, their peers are, are responsive to and life can become uh, more challenging for them but crucially it just looks different than what we're expecting to see so in girls, often we pick up first on signs like anxiety um, or we might see some kind of sort of obsessive or perfectionist type behaviours and we will often diagnose with other things or we'll go down other routes. Anxiety and autism are kind of very best friends um, for many, many people with autism. Anxiety is something that they live with and manage every day. And in our girls in particular, we find that this is often the big thing thing that we see presented and that that can often mean that we're not picking up um, on other issues because we think this is this is just anxiety and we're looking at what kind of anxiety and how do we help with that and we don't necessarily realize that the cause of the anxiety or the thing that sits alongside it might be autism so we often get this misdiagnosis um, 
um, or a first and primary diagnosis that means we don't see the autism. The next thing about girls is that they are brilliant imitators. So girls are really, really good at copying what they see around them. And also they will often look to things like um, books or um, YouTube these days or films or TV shows or things like that that they might really like and really get very, very lost in. Many autistic girls will be very avid readers and get lost in these worlds. And they learn a lot from that and by watching the people around them about how to be. And they copy that because they get a good response when they behave um, in the way that other people do. And the thing you have to remember is that we only know how the world feels to ourselves. We never have the chance to stand in someone else's shoes. So as a young autistic girl, when you are watching everyone else and you realize that, well, OK, this is quite hard work, but I'm going to learn the rules and I'm going to copy them and mimic them and imitate them. Um, and then the world kind of works for you, even though that's quite tiring. You don't realize that everyone else isn't having to do it that way, that these things feel more natural to other people. Girls won't necessarily know that they're doing this. They won't be aware that they're kind of imitating and mimicking and copying. And sometimes later on and with um, understanding of self and as we begin to pick this apart, they can see this in themselves, but often it's quite a natural thing um, that will, will happen in those earlier days. Um, so we see, you know, they're very good imitators. So we may well not pick up on the issues because they're not, we're not presenting. They're, they're mimicking their friends. They, they look normal. Um, they look neurotypical. The other thing that we see in girls um, is that they mask really well. And um, masking is about presenting um, neurotypically. It's about hiding uh, what's going on for us. It's about feeling that anxiety, feeling the fear and just getting on and doing things anyway. And this can mean that we're able to manage in all sorts of different situations, but it does come at great cost. And this is one of the things that Jodie looks at in her course is why autistic masking you know, can be an issue for girls and how it can really result in burnout. Um, and this is one of the things when we're thinking about how we support autistic girls to manage is actually understand you know actually sometimes masking is a really helpful skill and it's something that many of us learn to do but actually sometimes we need to be given permission to actually take off that mask um, and to, to kind of be ourselves but so that masking again along with the mimicking and the imitating these are things that mean that we don't see that there's an issue because what we're seeing is a child who is essentially presenting as neurotypical does that make sense so far yeah, so they're, they're copying really well. They're masking the issues as they're arising. They're doing what we do on a really tough day. Yeah, when you've had a really bad night's sleep, you've got loads of stuff going on at home, but maybe you've got a class to teach children to support. You put on your game face and you get on with it. For some autistic girls, this is their every day, but it means that to us, they look neurotypical. Um, other things that mean we don't pick up on, on issues with our girls early is that some of the things that we expect to see in autism look different in girls. So something that we're really familiar with with autism is that many autistic children will have special interests. And with our boys, we will often see that that's Lego or trains. There are certain things that they go to and we begin to think that for the boy who has those interests, we begin to wonder and we become curious about maybe autism is a possibility here. For our girls, those special interests often take a much more socially acceptable kind of form. And it means, again, that they might be able to interact um, with other girls um, in a way that for us seems neurotypical. So these special interests might be around animals. That's quite typical in our girls. It might be things like um, sort of um, ballet, pop stars, these kinds of things that we just expect to see um, our girls kind of talking about. And just as a kind of little caveat here, I'm talking about the presentation of boys and girls here because we're thinking about autistic girls. There are men and boys who present in a more female way as well. Uh, as well, and, and this kind of division is perhaps, you know, not quite as clear cut as it might seem, but we're thinking specifically about why we miss girls. And it's this more typically female presentation that uh, we're, we're kind of missing out on. And the final point I wanted to make here about why we so often miss autism and girls is that um, 
another thing that we think we know about autism is that um, this kind of lack of empathy and lack of emotion um, that we have been taught to expect to see and that's kind of a, a real kind of misconception about autism generally and actually our boys um, and men with autism also will often feel things very deeply will often have great empathy they might not express it in the same way and it might be more difficult for them to interpret the feelings of others however they are thinking feeling salient beings who, who think and feel things. In girls though, often we will see that they're um, what we would call hyper emotional. So rather than kind of seeming devoid and, and removed from emotion, actually we'll often find that they're more emotional um, than their peers. And this just doesn't kind of sit with what we think of as a typical um, autistic presentation. So if you've got a girl who you're, you're, you've got to mind, who is, you know, someone who gets the extremes of emotion, then it's possible um, that, you know, autism is, is a possibility there. Whereas traditionally we might automatically assume that a child who feels things really deeply in that way couldn't possibly be autistic. So these are kind of key reasons why we might uh, why we might miss it and I think that um, the, the the question to kind of go away and sort of think about here um, would be does it matter if we don't always pick our girls up very promptly? And maybe if you've got thoughts on that, just, just type them in the, the chat box. We won't go to breakout rooms yet because there's so many of us and it takes a, a couple of minutes to go in and out, but just thinking, does it matter? Um, and I think that one thing here that I would ask of you and yourselves really is that if there are things that you learn today or that you've learned because you've created, you know, you've become interested in autism in girls, that means that you think that you've missed this in the past um, or perhaps as a child that will come to mind today as you're um, you're learning with us um, that you you think oh I've, I've perhaps let them down we haven't we haven't pursued this avenue before uh, to be kind and forgiving to yourself we can't change what has happened but we can change uh, what we do moving forward so even if you think that you're picking someone up really late actually you can make a change as of tomorrow and begin to, to do things a little bit differently um, but does it matter that we don't always pick it up promptly um, and how forgiving should we be of ourselves for that and how early should we be beginning to start looking um, there are some um, great um, resources out there that can help us to start looking for these signs really really early and I've worked with early years practitioners who with children you know very very young children coming in at um, sort of nursery uh, age are able to begin to pick up on these signs but it does really take a lot of skill um, and training to begin to recognize that and to have a bit of confidence to pursue when you've got a bit of a niggle that things might not feel um, quite right here. So Kathy here saying yes it does matter as girls can be considered subjectively without diagnosis. Yes and that's something that we'll come on to um, a little bit later actually Kathy um, and others as well. So one of the things here when we're thinking about the signs that we look out for and how can we recognize um, that a girl might be autistic it's really important just to note at this point that the process for getting an autism diagnosis is really really long and slow. Um, and so actually if you think that you're seeing these signs um, in a girl that you're you're working with or otherwise caring for um, then it's worth thinking about how you can support and how you would support her if she were autistic because those things will never do harm you could universally apply these approaches and they would do good rather than harm um, and you can treat as if in the meantime some people never actually pursue a formal diagnosis with autism you know we, we think or almost think a bit like you would with dyslexia these days where we say do you know whether or not we get that diagnosis the things that we would put in place will help they certainly won't hinder um so perhaps in the meantime we treat um as if so louise saying yes it matters hugely because when we when it when it does become more apparent their mental health deteriorates quickly yeah and i think again for for girls well for anyone with autism if it's not picked up and we don't support appropriately and we don't help them to learn how to understand themselves and to gain a bit of an understanding about who they are and why things feel the way that they do and teaching them strategies for managing day to day as well um crucially giving themselves enough downtime and enough time to reset in between times we do find it really can impact on their mental health it's really really difficult trying to live in a neurotypical world when you're neurodivergent if you haven't been taught the strategies and if you don't give yourself uh, or aren't given respite from it sometimes too and um, the other thing i think that's helpful here and people mentioning in the comments is that 
when we recognize that a girl is autistic, actually that gives us um, a kind of tribe with which they can identify and it gives us a set of tools that we can lean into and sometimes a helpful label that we can use um, with other adults who are involved um, in their care, whether that's at school um, or home um, or elsewhere. Um, how easy is it, Jenny says, to go down a formal assessment route um, when a girl is young and very good at masking, imitating and probably won't recognise it in themselves? It can be quite challenging um, and I think this is something really worth recognising and you'd really want to look at this as a team around the child, working with, uh, with the family and the school together, um, understanding what you think you're recognising and also just stopping and asking the question, what do we think we'll get out of a formal diagnosis? Will it actually move things forwards or um, should we recognise that this might be an issue and we'll start to support as if and see if that has a positive impact and perhaps pursue this later um, if we if we need to. So in terms of the signs that we can be looking out for um, whilst recognising that there are you know severe limitations to potentially getting an actual diagnosis but assuming you might look for these signs and treat as if in the meantime um, some key things to look for in terms of recognising autism in girls because it's hard to spot, they're masking, they're imitating, they might just come across as fairly neurotypical. So firstly, anxiety. Girls who seem highly anxious um, should be, you know, we would be looking to, to support them in any case, um, but many, many girls who are autistic will struggle with anxiety and we will often find that as they go through primary school, particularly as they're getting up towards the upper end of primary school, that that anxiety will worsen. We will find them perhaps going to extreme lengths to avoid things, places, people, situations that provoke anxiety and actually that can often present as school avoidance um, as well. So we see a lot of um, uh, overlap between um, autistic girls and uh, school-based anxi anxiety and avoidance because schools are a really hard place if you're autistic, particularly if it's not been recognised. So anxiety, that can also come across as a girl being very, very shy or quiet. And again, if you put yourself in the shoes of a girl who is autistic, who doesn't really quite understand the world, it happens in quite a strange way. It's like being transplanted into a totally different culture overnight. You wake up tomorrow in a, in a culture that you've never been in before and you just don't know how to be here. That's how it feels every day for an autistic girl. And so that does provoke anxiety because you're having to just double and triple and quadruple think every single interaction that you have and you feel things in this hyper emotional way so if you get things wrong if you say the wrong thing you make a bit of a fool of yourself or you know you, you do something in class that's not quite appropriate actually you feel that in a really big way you can't just brush it off and move on uh, like your peers might be able to you feel it really deeply so again that really adds to this feeling of anxiety and what can, that can mean is that these girls will withdraw and become very quiet and shy because they fear doing and saying the wrong thing and so perhaps they do and say very uh, very little as well also it can be difficult for them to um, form and keep friendships particularly as they get older um, and again that can mean they seem quite withdrawn um, and quiet with younger children um, younger autistic girls they can come across like they're getting on quite well with their friends and you might see them being quite imaginative or you think they're being quite imaginative in their play and their conversation might be quite good but when we look a little bit closer what we'll often find is that these girls have um, created kind of whole worlds and they're directing play so rather than going into kind of really imaginative role play it's like this constructed world like um, you know if you created a world in mind Minecraft say it's a bit like this for them and they've got this very clear idea often of this 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 world they've imagined and they will prescribe what the characters say and do so you might find that these girls kind of really dominate play um, and that they're kind of scripting it for other children and they can get frustrated when other children don't want to play in that way that's something we will often see in our, our autistic girls and that's often fine um, when the children are younger as they get a bit older and the other kids don't want to be bossed around and told how to play by this child that can be when friendship issues begin to arise and these girls begin not to um, kind of thrive in the school environment and, and, and you get these sort of friendship issues and, and, and perhaps some bullying and, and, and sort of friend yeah 
social social difficulties there as well and the other thing with the language is often you'll find that when you stop and you listen to their language whilst they might seem very fluent um and as if that you know conversations happen quite naturally and those interactions are good and positive often again this is quite scripted quite learned they might have learned it from books or from watching other people and you might find they don't deviate too far um, from what's familiar to them and when put in new situations that you'll find that they begin to struggle one thing we we see as well, whole other aside, is that sometimes that we'll see kind of um, selective mutism or tendencies that way um, in in girls who are autistic or otherwise highly anxious. So mutism has been re-diagnosed, or yeah, re-diagnosed, re-categorized as a, as an anxious disorder, an anxiety disorder. Um, and so again, when very very anxious or in situations which provoke huge anxiety, you might find that that girls just completely stop talking um so that might be something that you notice any i'm just checking in any questions anyone who's not okay yeah so yeah keep up there's really interesting things coming up try uh, sophie rather will tell me if there's anything i specifically need to answer as we go but um other warning signs that you might see so we kind of talked about uh, anxiety in all its many forms you might find that she goes very shy or quiet that she tends to kind of direct and dominate play another really key indicator is if you've got a girl who seems to have a dual personality um in particular that you've got a girl perhaps who you know you perhaps you work at school and she seems absolutely fine and then she goes home and it's really challenging for the family or vice versa but it's usually that school is okay and that home is really challenging um, and this is quite typical because this might be a girl who is imitating masking trying to do all the things that get all the good praise and positive um, responses when at school and then they go home and they're exhausted and the mask comes off and we get the kind of melts down or shuts down so they might either get kind of very very kind of angry or big and loud and melts down in quite a loud way or they go into complete shutdown and go very very quiet and and, and kind of completely shut off um, from the world and both those things are fairly typical this is really important to note because a it's a key indicator that autism may be a potential diagnosis here but also that this is something that for, for parents and there will be parents and carers on on the the webinar here i'm sure um often we as parents and carers feel we're doing something horribly wrong because here's our our daughter who we're hearing from school is a perfect child works really really hard often very academically able gets on okay with peers it seems and then they come home and uh, we can't interact at all it's awful everything's terrible the whole time and, and how can it you know this Jekyll and Hyde be and that must mean that as a parent or carer I'm doing something horribly wrong and what is it not the case actually very very often when we see this this is that the girl feels comfortable at home they are in their safe place and actually finally they can let go and it kind of often comes out in these quite challenging ways um and so that's sometimes what's happening there. So if you're seeing this dual personality, um, really, really crucial and really important to work with the family and help them understand this is not a failing on their part, but yes, we do all need to work together to think about how to make those transitions work and how to support a child so they're not getting to that point where their day has become so overwhelming that by the time they go home, they're no longer able to cope um, and manage. Sorry, Pookie, here's a really good question about do yes. these behaviours typically get worse with age? Um, do they typically? OK, good question. Um, I think I don't know that I have a really good answer to that. Um, but what I would say is if we don't recognise um, that there's a problem and we don't support, then often we will find in particular that mental health will suffer. So we will often find that anxiety will worsen. We do find that girls with autism are more prone to things like self-harm and eating disorders. Um, I'm involved in a fascinating research project about the comorbidity of anorexia and autism. Um, and there's a very high prevalence when we, we stop and we start assessing uh, women with anorexia, um, about a quarter we think, but it's quite early on, about a quarter um, are autistic. And so if we don't um, recognise and we don't support, then the, you know, there can be quite negative outcomes and it can make life very, very difficult. Because it's hard. It's really, really hard to, to live with autism without the right support and understanding of self um, and the world. Whether it specifically worsens with age, I think the, the tricky thing for girls in particular is just that their friends are less open to 
them acting in the way that comes more naturally to them um, as they get older. So we often find that in primary school by about year five is when things begin to get really, really challenging um, for those girls where, um, yeah, they are, it's no longer really okay with their friends for them to dominate play and tell them what to do. Um, and where actually the limits of what we can do purely by mimicking and copying kind of reaches, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's end point um, and it becomes more apparent that, uh, yeah, we're, we're not quite like our friends and, and friends become less tolerant and, and so on and so forth. And it's really important here that we think about how do we help girls to understand themselves and help peers to understand um, each other. That's, um, yeah, that's really, really, really crucial. Um, I hope that answers the question. Sorry, I sometimes just don't know the answer. <laughs> Um, uh, other other kind of signs that we would be um, sort of that, that might sort of suggest there's an issue here. So I mentioned before about girls potentially being avid readers, and that's something that um, uh, we often will see in our autistic girls. Not always, and all these signs. You know, when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. So you won't see all of these signs, and, and you know, you'll see different things as well. But being an avid reader, really getting very lost in, in kind of um, other worlds that kind of make sense and have clear rules and we know who the people are and we can read about it and learn from it crucially um, how to manage in the world. Um, we will often see that. So being really, yeah, really avid readers or getting lost in other worlds. It might be um, computer games for some, it will be kind of YouTube channels, a bit hard to differentiate that from uh, their neurotypical peers, of course, but it's the, the, the level of that obsession really and seeing them really mimicking uh, what what they're what they're learning there um, um, finding that they're beginning to struggle with their friendships from about age nine or ten so that's about year five here in England um, and then also that you will as things uh, begin to worsen or if things begin to worsen for them you will sometimes find that these girls do become overwhelmed and either that they will melt down and that's our kind of big response to not managing anymore where we become very anxious in a big way or very angry or that they shut down um, and this is uh, you know where they they become quite incommunicative so where we're thinking about our fight flight freeze sh sort of meltdown is your fight in your flight response and uh, shutdown is your, your freeze response essentially both just as a point of reference both are a child who is extremely distressed, who is no longer coping, who really needs your help. So the child who is in shutdown, if you are a, a teacher, an educator, the girl who is in shutdown might not be causing problems in your classroom and you might not respond to them in the same way as the girl or the boy who's throwing things around and biting and kicking and screaming, but their distress, um, their inability to cope right now is every bit as deserving of our attention and does need our response and support to help them to, to regulate. Um, the the kind of final um final point i wanted to make in terms of signs to look out for before i give you a moment to just reflect on what you've heard so far and, and think of any questions in your breakout rooms is that you will often find with the girls um that they are really academically able they get on quite well in school they are quite good at doing um what's needed to get a positive response uh, from the adults around them but they tend to be pretty inflexible and quite perfectionist in their approach. So if you're seeing this kind of perfectionist tendencies and they're very able, but they need to always sit in the same place or do things in a certain way, or they need things to be quite consistent and predictable, all kids need and want that to a certain extent, but our autistic girls in particular thrive on that and can become quite challenging uh, if that uh, isn't uh, sort of stuck to and adhered to, quite unable to, to manage change. Okay, I'm gonna chuck you into your breakout rooms for five minutes to, to give you a moment to reflect on what you've heard. And I want you to have a think um, in your breakout rooms, if there are any of those signs that surprise you and if a particular child has come to mind, but also take the discussion wherever you want. I'm gonna give you five or six minutes there. Do speak, do use that opportunity, talk to each other and then come back with any thoughts, reflections or questions and pop them in the chat. Um, and we will address those um, at the end, if not now. So Sophie, if you can chuck everyone into their rooms, if you don't have a camera or you don't have audio, you can chat in your room on the, on the box. We've we've avoided that moment for, for everybody. Um, yeah, so we shall continue. So, OK, so anything in the chat that we want to address before we move on? Uh, so have you been having a look at that? Or are you too busy trying to make breakout rooms work? Uh, I have been um, looking at that. There have been a few questions. What would cause a girl to mask at home and release at school rather than the other way around? 
Okay, um, so that does happen sometimes. Um, more typically, um, it happens the other way around. But sometimes, you know, as we know, for some children, school is their safe place. And if school is your safe place, that is the place where perhaps you will be kind of more yourself and allow your mask to drop. Perhaps you've built a particularly good relationship with a trusted adult at school, or maybe you formed a really strong friendship. Autistic girls do form really good close bonds if they find the right person. Often they will form individual friendships rather than uh, friendship groups we find but you know if you find a place where you feel really safe to be yourself um, then you may find that the, the mask is dropped there and if you know things are challenging at home or they've been perhaps um, punished reprimanded had a negative response to the kind of autistic behaviors then we might find that those behaviors um, are masked and you know we, we see this in it's not just an autism thing you know children respond uh, based on the feedback that they're given and how safe they feel in a given environment a child who feels safe um, will be more themselves um, and uh, a child who, who feels uh, less safe or is getting negative feedback for what they're doing will generally uh, modify their behavior um, and and and, and a, a, a thing there just to understand just in terms of, of, of behavior is that a bit like I said before, we need to help parents and carers understand that if a child is seeming not to manage at home when they're coping really well at school and so we think that we're doing something wrong, just more generally, as an adult, if you build a really good trusting relationship with a child, um, then you may find that their behaviour begins to deteriorate because actually it may be that they begin to feel more comfortable with you and that they don't work so hard um, to mask um, how they're feeling um, and so we sometimes have this kind of slightly painful bit where they're um they've not yet begun to to learn strategies to, to to manage and regulate because you're perhaps still working on that with them um but um they feel able to be themselves so that should be seen actually as a, a positive sign although it might not feel like it at the time um just yeah worth noting any other ones you want me to respond to you right now so um if you're looking to refer a teenager for diagnosis where would be your first port of call Good question. So um, it, it, pathways are different in different areas. So um, generally speaking, um, it, it might be a Senko who asked the question. Uh, if so, do do say. But normally I would go and I would speak to my Senko. I would speak to my Senko network, find out what happens locally. Um, a GP is often a really good um, port of call. Um, if in doubt, um, go to the National Autistic Society. They've got really good information um, on their website and can often help to direct. Um, and they have got, they respond to queries as well. Well. Um, so they're a really good place to go. But it, yeah, it just it really varies um, in different places. But every local area should have um, a, a recognised pathway. And um, it's just about understanding what that is um, in your area. But yeah, I would talk to my Senko if I'm not the Senko. Um, I would talk to my Senko network if I am a Senko and get advice from other Senkos. Um, and I would uh, consider talking to the, the GP and the National Autistic Society. Any more? Um, here's a, there's loads of questions that they keep on piling up. Uh, are there differences? Okay, one more and then I'll move on. Go on. Yeah. Are there differences in how girls are affected by sensory difficulties? Good question. So yes and no. Um, so autistic girls like autistic boys often really struggle with um, being uh, sort of sensory overload. Some have the opposite and don't really kind of feel things, but often we'll find that yeah sensory is they get overstimulated basically by um kind of noise sound the feel of things um and the the main difference in terms of um their response to it is is more about what we see rather than what they're feeling so um we generally find that girls are, are better at kind of just pretending to be fine uh, about it whereas um we don't so much see that with our boys although again some of them will mask that so um but no the the kind of overstimulation that that issues around sensory issues is is similar for girls and boys we believe um and that's something that when we're thinking and i'll move on now to about our practical strategies for supporting one of the kind of key things that we always think about when trying to support autistic children is actually trying to create an environment or a 
safe space they can go to, which is really calm and quiet. So in particular, those of us who are working in early years or primary settings, we have traditionally had these really busy, bright, wonderful classrooms. And they're so fun and so wonderful to look at. And there's always so many different things to see. But if you're a child who is like overwhelmed by the world generally, um, being in a really, really busy, bright classroom, and there might be quite a lot of different noises and smells and stuff going on as well, that can be quite overwhelming. And having even just a little corner, um, I've seen it done in classrooms where it just, you know, there's a there's a desk with a pillow and a safe space under there um, where they can just go and be quiet, where it's kind of a bit a bit cooler, calmer, darker, a bit more neutral um, can be super, super helpful. Um, and increasingly schools, many schools I work with are moving towards having a more kind of calmer, more neutral environment generally, because we know that what helps our autistic children tends to help everyone to, to regulate. And there'll be many uh, kids on the spectrum who haven't been diagnosed who'd benefit from this. But um, as a minimum, thinking about where would be a calm, safe, neutral space um, that this child could retreat to if needed, ideally um, within the classroom or within the home that they can go to as and when um, and uh, proactively as well as reactively. So reactively being, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I need to go to my safe space, but proactively being, I know that if I go to this safe space regularly for just a minute or two, perhaps, you know, at break times, um, then I'm able to kind of emotionally regulate and then continue with my day better. So I think when we're thinking about autism and our ability to manage and emotionally regulate, um, for me, the most helpful analogy is to think of myself as like a computer character. So, you know, like when you're a computer character, you have the energy bar. Yeah. Um, and if you're playing like sort of street fight or something like that you need a certain amount of energy or you die um and um you will break it down in street fighter by being hit or blown or headlocked or whatever but in an autistic person's life that is through social interaction or a really busy environment or really strange sounds or things being out of routine there'll be all sorts of different things that will knock that energy bar down and it's about understanding what will help to build that energy bar back up and actually just having a little bit of time in a safe space perhaps with some kind of fidget toys or using practicing kind of breathing calming relaxing strategies will help to build that energy bar back up and we don't have to wait till the point at which we die um, until we begin to do that um, much more effective if we kind of you know every now and then as that energy is dipping um, that we build it back up um, another analogy uh, you can look up um, and can be a really helpful starting point for conversation particularly with older autistic girls is spoon theory there's a lovely TED talk um, where I can't can't remember the name of the woman now but she talks about spoons it's about chronic illness and how when you're chronically ill um everything um takes a certain number of spoons so you start the day with 20 spoons um, and throughout the day you're you're using these spoons to to interact to get up to work to whatever it might be and then you need to do things to to bring more spoons back every now and then so you don't run out of spoons um so people refer to themselves as spoonies um it's yeah spoon theory so that's a, a nice analogy that girls might understand um and i have occasionally done it with um kids where we've done it as a, as a physical thing like we we've sat there with spoons um, and we've talked about a typical day and we've thought about well how many spoons do you think that activity would cost and actually kind of put them down and then go oh well if you know break time and being out and about in the playground and all that noise and um you know the all the different discussions that you're having with other children means that you've that's cost you five spoons what could we do just after break to try and get back a couple of those spoons oh okay maybe uh, you know five minutes of mindfulness or an opportunity to sit in the reading corner for for a few minutes with a buddy or going and talking to the school dog or whatever it might be and, and you can kind of work through the day like that and try and think about what are the what are the costs um, of the different things that they're doing and how can we build that energy or the spoons uh, back up so communication and, and the key thing here is just keep on talking uh, to her keep on trying to understand more about her help her understand more about herself um, and be curious and think about what's working um, and what's not other things in terms of our practical strategies um, for supporting remembering that um, it can take a long time to get a diagnosis so if you suspect then treat as if will do no harm work with the family so 
we'll have all sorts here on the webinar. Um, you will, some of you will be here because you are family. Some of you will be here because you're educators. I know we've also got school nurses and social workers. We have all kinds of people. And this works best when the child is at the center of what we're doing and we're all working as a team around the child. We must, as educators in particular, work with families. If a family are telling you, I suspect my daughter might be autistic, please listen. It's so common that we find out that girls get really late diagnosis, but mum, dad, carer have been saying for years that they think that something's wrong, something's not quite right here, and they're not sure what it is, and sometimes they suspect autism, or they might suspect other things. When you hear those suspicions, listen to the families. They won't always be right, but they will often. Um, and when we come together and we provide, you know, an environment where we can hear each other and we can explore curiously together with the child's best interest right at the heart of it, often we will come to ways of working and supporting much more quickly than we do when we're more dismissive of those concerns, which can sometimes happen. I'm sure this wouldn't happen. You wouldn't be here if you weren't someone who listened, but try to encourage colleagues to do the same and make sure that you know if families have concerns about their child that there's a really clear pathway that they know where to go with those concerns who to talk to other things that we can do in terms of supporting and remember you will get notes on all this i'm i'm referring to my crib sheet so you'll get my crib sheet um other things that can that can help um is emotional literacy and skills around emotional regulation we have got i was going to say we have a fantastic course i wrote it so that's really i have been more modest more modest we, we we have a course that i, I think is okay um, around emotional regulation in autistic children um on the website which we'll send you a link to afterwards um and this is about how we as adults can teach our children to better emotionally regulate to manage the feelings of distress and overwhelm that we might feel in any given day um, we also need to help them to recognize those feelings what it actually feels like what's going on here um, and to, to kind of work through those things and also learn to let us know uh, when there are issues too but essentially just really learning together about how a child is feeling um, and what they can do to change how they feel when when we teach um, children or adults if they've never learnt and you will work with families where the adults have never learned when we teach people the skills around emotional regulation about changing how we feel taking a feeling of overwhelm and managing to calm it down and get back to a point where we're able to think we're able to problem solve we're able to access all those higher level cognitive skills that's like a superpower. So if you can teach a child that, you can teach them simple breathing techniques, relaxation techniques, grounding techniques. No, there's no end of them. And I will link again through to a few of my YouTube videos that share some of those simple strategies. But when you teach these strategies to kids, it's like a superpower. When we realize that when I feel like this, there's something I can do, I'm in control of that. It's amazing. So I will often teach kids things like the five finger breathing techniques. So it's where we um, take one hand and, and put it out in front of us and we take the other hand and we breathe in as we draw up our thumb and then we hold, we breathe out and we hold, we breathe in and we hold, we go around the whole hand. And this is really effective because we take our hands everywhere. Um, so we've always got them with us. It's really tactile. It's easy to remember. It's a good and simple script and it helps us take control of our breathing. Um, and that helps us to feel fundamentally a little bit different. Um, and so, yeah, it's like a superpower. They're teaching children to understand what they're feeling, to name it, um, to, to share it with other people as appropriate, and to take steps to change how they feel when they don't like uh, how they're feeling can be super helpful. Um, we talked already about the safe space to, to retreat to and thinking about using that proactively as well as reactively. Um, and um, and the, the kind of the proactive bit there, I always term as mini resets. So I would think with any child who is prone to overwhelm for whatever reason, I would think about what points in the day would it be helpful for them to have a mini reset and what that mini reset looks like will depend on the child it's whatever for them works in terms of you know building that energy bar back up replacing those spoons um, and for our autistic children often it is a calm quiet environment where they're not overstimulated so I will often say uh, in jest that after something like this I go and lie in a darkened room it, it's kind of said half in jest that's basically what I do and if we did this face face like tomorrow I'm teaching a conference all day if we actually did that 
in like in the old days when that used to happen with with people all in the room together I would literally the day after that really barely speak to anyone and just stay in a very very calm and, and quiet kind of place um and so we need to think for for the child what works for them for, for other kids who become overwhelmed for other reasons for some of them they will need to kind of have the opportunity to to kind of get it out um they might have different things on their mind they need to write them down or draw them or play them or whatever but those mini resets will look different for different kids but we want to build them in at various points throughout the day in order to enable them to continue to cope think particularly here about transitions um, and think particularly about if there are certain things that a child finds especially challenging whether we can help them to find that place of coping and calm before they enter that situation so if for example they hate lunchtime they find it really hard it's too noisy they don't know how they're meant to be then if we help them to kind of find a place where they're relatively coping and calm before they enter lunchtime they're more likely to be able to to manage it other things we can do with our autistic girls, teach them about friendships, actually help them understand how friendship works, what it means to be a good friend, how we do that, what's expected of us, how we can uh, interact in a way um, and what friends expect of us and what we can expect of them. We often assume that these often very articulate, very academic girls, that they've got it sorted, that they understand all these things, but often they don't really understand exactly about how they feel and they don't really understand about friendships and how they work. So we need to teach them and explore it with them and be curious about it with them. And finally, um, helping them to find and make friends um, in particular if they can make at least one really good solid friendship that's really helpful and their kind of special interest the thing that they really like can often be a really good way into that so if they particularly like a, a certain hobby for example finding um, another another child who shares that hobby with them can mean that they get on uh, very well um, and and the other thing here is that we will often find um, that uh, autistic children will get on well with other autistic children not always and as I've said already a couple of times when you've met one autistic person you've met one autistic person just because two children are autistic doesn't mean they'll automatically get on but it might and it's worth considering okay any any kind of quick questions there before we go on to the last uh, last bit there's been loads of things put into the chat um I'm just trying to think of, uh, there's a really good one that I think is ideal for you to answer. Is it beneficial for adult females to realise they are autistic? Yeah. Okay. So yes. Um, I, I, yes, definitely. Um, I, from a, I can only, um, that's the thing. I can tell you from, from my point of view and from other adult females that I've spoken to about it on a more personal rather than professional level, I guess. Um, for me, it was a hugely important realization, but quite a challenging one. So, uh, some of you will know the story. So apologies for repeating, but the, the reason that I came to be diagnosed was because I was, uh, in hospital with anorexia and I was very, very sick. Um, and I wasn't getting getting better in fact I was actively getting worse and the more that the hospital tried to treat the anorexia the worse it was getting and um, so I was not only unresponsive to treatment but it was actively sort of harmful um, and I was yeah very uh, very high risk of death um, and at that point um, it was suggested my care team kind of came together to try and understand really what on earth was going on um, and this was before the pathway for autism and anorexia existed and it's why I'm on the, the team there working on it um, but it was suggested that perhaps I was autistic and perhaps they should start to treat uh, as if and overnight uh, things began to completely change and that was partly because um, we all had a better understanding of the things that would help me and how to stop me feeling so overwhelmed all the time I was no longer forced to do loads of group therapy for example um, in which I became completely mute um, as a point of interest um, and um, the other thing was that it meant that my treatment team were more flexible around lots of parts of my uh, treatment and the things that they were trying to force because they thought what they were seeing was anorexia when actually what they were seeing was autism um, and that by trying to force things like trying to make me try different flavors of things for example just wasn't a helpful approach um, and so they radically changed their approach and, and changed their focus however so it was helpful from that point of view and longer term so that was about three years ago now four years ago maybe um 
it helped me to manage. So I had gone through periods, my whole life has been a period of basically uh, managing really well, really thriving, being hugely productive and very, very successful, and then completely crashing and burning and everything going horribly wrong. And that's basically been a cycle forever. Um, and um, now I hope, touch wood, I'm kind of out of that cycle because I'm able to take steps to manage every day. So those were all really positive things. But the negative thing was that when I got a label of autism, I suddenly realized this was something I had to live with forever. So anorexia is something that you work to overcome and um, wouldn't be a significant part of your life, you hope, every day at some point um, autism doesn't go away and realizing that some of the aspirations that I had for my future were never going to be realized because actually I was basing my interpretation of my future reality on um, an impossible you know it, I was never going to be I, I, in particular I think I remember being very very ill and thinking one day when I'm better I will host big dinner parties and for some reason this was something I had latched onto as an idea and um, I, I don't I'm now at peace with the idea that I, I don't want to do that I wouldn't want to do that it wouldn't be helpful to me I wouldn't enjoy it but at the time letting go of that kind of yeah future was was a bit challenging so yeah it was difficult from that point of view but the a really great thing about um get, getting a diagnosis later is a we often find that autism is quite heritable and so often autistic parents have autistic children and many autistic adults learn they're autistic when going through the diagnosis process with their child and um when we begin to understand more about ourselves we can really support our child well so that's really positive but also it means suddenly we know who we are and we can identify with other people like us and we can ask people to help us so um we can ask people to make um what's the word reasonable adjustments uh, to help us all the time so yeah basically i would say yeah it's a good thing it's a good thing um okay final point and i will happily stay on for questions um after five um as many as we have but i'm aware some of you will need to, to log off so final thing i want to just talk about is about the importance of taking a strengths-based approach when we're working with our girls with autism. And actually, I mean, this is a point I come back to all the time, no matter what um, you know title this session had, um, what um, kind of additional or special need we were talking about, a strengths-based approach is always the right approach, in my opinion. We need to sometimes just forget about momentarily the challenges that might come with a label, and there are challenges, and actually look into what makes this child unique, and in particular with autism, what are the good things that it brings? So actually there are brilliant positives that come alongside autism. Some of those traits, um, once we learn to understand ourselves and to manage day to day, some of the autistic traits can make for the most brilliant people. We will often find um, that our autistic girls and boys um, are very good at being really hyper-focused and really interested and engaged with specific areas of interest. And Sometimes children are encouraged to think more broadly and move away from the special interest because this is something that's to do with your diagnosis and therefore bad. But actually, you know, other people have hobbies and interests and passions and that's okay. And autistic people have special interests and that's bad. No, just forget that. If a child has a special interest, use it, lean into it, have a think. You know, this girl loves animals, is obsessed with animals, reads everything, watches everything about animals. Great, maybe she'll be a vet one day actually lean into that special interest encourage it obviously we need to make sure that she's able to talk to and engage about other things as well but but lean into those special interests she really cares about them use them to your advantage um there are other traits here so Often again, we'll find our autistic girls are really brilliant friends. When they make a friendship, they might not make many, but they'll often make really good, deep friendships and they're often really, really loyal. You have to protect them because if this friendship goes wrong, it will be devastating for them. And they can often be very vulnerable to being taken advantage of. And, and you know, so we need to really help them to learn and understand around things like consent um, and looking for signs that things aren't going okay and who we should talk to but they can make brilliant, brilliant partners and friends, really, really loyal, um, yeah, good, good, good people. Um, and if you're an educator, you'll often find that they are very eager to please in the classroom, very able, often able to, to learn new things very well. It might take them a little bit longer and you might need to simplify uh, your instruction sometimes and repeat a little bit more often at the beginning, but often you will find that they are very, very capable. Um, we have to try to encourage them to be bold and brave in their learning and not too perfectionist or obsessed 
obsessive, um, but yes, they can be absolute asset in your classroom. Um, the other thing I'd say here around this kind of strength based uh, approach is to look for role models for your autistic girls. So it's um, there are more and more people out there who you can look to um, as role models. I would uh, particularly recommend um, uh, Sienna Castellan. Uh, Castellan. So this is her book, um, uh, which, again, I'll put in the list of uh, this is the other book. I'm just going to say, like, whilst I'm saying what you should read, if you read two things, read these. Um, I'll put links to them in the notes. But so Sienna was saying. 17 when she wrote this book she's autistic she's awesome um, and she would be a really good role model this is also a really good book to read and share with an autistic girl about it's just about life the universe and everything if you're an autistic girl um, the other really good role models to look to I don't have the book to hand because I'm a fool and I've left it in the other house um, but the other uh, really really good role models are the children at Limpsfield Grange so they wrote two books um, it's a, a a school for autistic girls um, and it's an amazing place. Um, so Limpsfield Grange Girls wrote with support um, M is for autism and M in the middle. Um, and M is for autism is, is helping you learn to, to manage uh, in uh, younger, when you're younger and uh, uh, M in the middle is, is kind of moving into sort of uh, middle and secondary school. Um, and then the other book is, ah, uh, uh, what's it called? It's gone completely from my head. Um, Libby Dillon. I can see you. Can you see me? I'll look it up and I'll put it on the list. But again, another child uh, who wrote with support um, a really uh, brilliant book um, and it includes specifically uh, ways in which you know that people can help her and things that help her um, as as it goes through so look for role models look for autistic role models the other thing is that if you ask around if you're in a school ask around within your staff staff you will have um, autistic autistic women if there are women on your staff who identify as autistic they might be very willing to talk to uh, your autistic girls and share their experiences um, and it can be really reassuring um, I get parents all the time saying, you know, oh, it's helpful for my daughter to know that you're an adult autistic woman and you're managing and um, that's inspiring. And um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's helpful for girls to know that it, it can be OK. Um, very, very final final point on this one uh, around strengths and taking that strengths based approach is just work with her work with the girl that you have in mind today to define her strengths um, and and her quirks and return to them really often and remind her um, that these are her awesome, this is what makes her who she is and try as hard as you can not to allow uh, life, the universe and everything in the system to kind of hammer these, these quirks out of her because um, she's brilliant just as she is. Um, and if we support her and we help her to manage and cope and thrive um, and try and help the world to adapt a little bit to her um, as well as her always adapting to the world um, that we'll find that, uh, yeah, she can be herself and uh, that's a really good thing. Okay, I'm aware some of you need to go because it's five, but I'm happy to stay on and I will continue to answer um, any questions that you have. Do not feel obliged to say at this point, if you have a question, do feel free to, or, or a comment or any other feedback or a resource you wanna share, either press and, press and hold the space bar or uh, pop it into, into the chat. Thank you so much for your attention and sorry we couldn't make the breakout rooms work. So Sophie, I'm leaning on you here. To, to... There's a, I was actually going to say there's a really good question, which has intrigued me. Are there any famous role models that some of my students can look at how they've achieved and not feel like failures? A female autistic women, female women. Um, I need to go away and have a think about that. I'm sure there are loads. I'll, do you know what? I will ask my uh, Twitter uh, followers to make some suggestions and uh, I will share a link to the tweet and then you can all have a look at that. I'll make myself a note to do that. Note to self. Um, and I believe the book title was called Can You See Me? That's it, yes. I can yeah. picture it. It's blue with a yellow. And there's going to be a follow-up as well. I'm very excited about this. It's a really brilliant book. Thank you. Wow, well, people are already putting in... Uh uh autistic women in the chat that they're so oh, quick <laughs> <laughs> that's really brilliant um i have to say uh, I, whilst many of you are still here as well i will continue answering questions in a minute just my husband will completely uh 
destroy me if I don't do my like hi creative education we're amazing things so many of you uh, already know about creative education so we are a uh, training company used to provide face-to-face -face training for, for for school staff um, and then the pandemic hit and um, it got interesting so it all went online so we now have hundreds hundreds no not hundreds yet over a hundred courses uh, that you can access on demand online um, either through a personal subscription or through an organizational or team membership um, all of which are really reasonable priced but all of which you can also do as a free trial so if you uh, would like to find out more about that Sophie you'll send everyone an email anyway won't you about it um, but in particular if you've got a team um, that uh, would like to have a, a free trial set up Sophie's sister uh, sorts that all out we love families here so me and my husband run the business with my mother-in-law and the cat obviously uh, and then uh, Sophie and her sister take care of much of the rest of it um, whilst her dad does our premises work um, so um, yeah Sophie's sister would help you get set up with a trial if you wanted to have your whole team able to access our courses and they cover all sorts of stuff loads of them are stuff I've done around kind of emotional well-being and mental health and SEND um, um, but there's a whole range of other stuff on there as well so if that's of interest we can set you up with a four week free trial so sophie will send you the details of how to um sort that out and maybe put eliza's email just in the chat in case anyone wants to email her directly so yeah no problem um there was a really good question uh, about a child who wears an elastic band to stop yeah. themselves from self-harming the child shows that they've snapped it so hard that it's left a mark yeah okay um it's like they really want it to snap good uh, is there any advice for that yes don't use an elastic band as an alternative to self-harm um this was a very widely advocated technique for many years it's in loads and loads and loads of recommendations of alternatives to self-harm including things i've written in the past it's no longer a um, strategy that we recommend um, there is new evidence that it does harm rather than good um, and just ends up as a kind of alternative um well, an alternative means of harm so whilst it was very very widely advocated for a long time um, we no longer do advocate it and we look to other alternatives instead um, we've got uh a course on self-harm on, on the site um, and actually um, I'm thinking about doing a longer more in-depth course around self-harm um, for anyone who's interested but the one on the site at the moment is around breaking that cycle of self-harm and so for the person who asked that might be a helpful course to go and have a look at um, and maybe include it in the if you wouldn't mind Sophie adding it to the notes that I sent through the self-harm course and, and maybe the eating disorders one as well because we really often see both those issues in our autistic girls yeah no problem um, and and just just to say there there will be loads of you listening who have recommended this, the, the elastic band thing and maybe still are and um are now thinking oh gosh I've done harm we we can only do the best that we can with the information knowledge understanding and skills that we have at the time forgive yourself but please as of tomorrow um don't advocate that anymore and look for some different strategies uh with that that particular uh child so in terms of um uh, like uh, you know it's a don't do the elastic band thing first point second is when we're trying to work out good strategies good alternatives to, to self-harm for an individual child um the most helpful question that we can ask ourselves or them is what is their unmet need basically what do they get out of self-harming um and to begin to understand this we're going to have to have some really good conversations with the child whether that's verbally or through play or writing or journaling there's all different ways that we can do this we want to try and understand basically what's in it for them have Habits do not form without some form of positive reinforcement. And if we can understand what's the good thing that happens when they self-harm, maybe they feel a bit calm. Maybe it makes them think about other things for a moment rather than all the horrible voices going around in their head. Maybe it gets them some much needed attention or support or listening from a trusted adult. There's all sorts of different reasons why a child might self-harm. When we understand what the unmet need is, what the positive is in it for them, then we can think, how else might that need be met? Um, and then we can begin to think what are different strategies that we might turn to um, could be. Brilliant. I'm just scrolling through so many lovely comments about how it's really great you being open with your own journey. It's been a really informative session. Um, would your course on self-harm apply to ASD girls? Yes, yes, it would. So. Um, Yes, the, the, the one thing I would say about self-harm and autism, so we get a really high prevalence of self-harm in autism, and often that is because sort of alongside our autism goes 
kind of mental health issues and, and, and challenges with managing because it's really overwhelming being autistic. The world is not designed for us and it's hard. Um, and if that's the case, if this is essentially related to kind of low mood, anxiety, then the regular kind of um, self-harm training will help. However, for some children who are autistic and self-harming, actually they're self-harming for a very different reason. Um, and this is a form of stimming for them. So stimming refers to essentially seeking ways of getting sensory input to help us to regulate and calm. So in um, our autistic boys in particular, we'll often kind of flapping or spinning. I tend to rock. Um, I find this when I watch myself back on, on, on video, if ever I'm standing, that I just rock. Um, but yeah, we'll do different things, but for some kids, some form of self-harm or um, kind of picking, biting, those sort of harmful behaviours um, can be because they're seeking that ability to, to regulate and calm themselves. And so that might be the unmet need, essentially. Um, and the course that I've done wouldn't necessarily specifically look at that. But if there's enough interest, I would really happily put together a course specifically around uh, self-harm and autism, though um, I think there's not there's not loads of really great stuff out there, but I'd be happy to do some research and, and you know, add to the canon uh, if, if there's a, if there's a need. So if, if that's of interest to you, then drop an email to us afterwards and let us know the questions that you're facing, what you've tried, what would be helpful for you if, if I were to put together a course on that. Um, is sleeping a problem generally? Uh, for autistic it can be um, yeah so yeah that's an interesting question so again what we will often find is that autistic girls it's quite messy like there's often a whole range of different issues that we're seeing but yes yeah, sleeping and eating um, we can see disturbances in both of those sleeping is often an issue for um, anyone who struggles with anxiety it can become uh, an issue because we've got lots of different thoughts racing around in our head so it can be linked to that um, and sometimes as well we will find that our autistic girls are just really tired because they're managing they're working so hard you wouldn't believe how hard an autistic child person anyone works all day every day just to do normal things it's really really tiring so we might find that they're very very tired um, and can seem kind of quite lethargic um, at times so we can get that kind of yeah both ends of the spectrum really kind of seemingly oversleeping needing more sleep than we might expect for their age and stage um, and then sometimes really struggling to sleep as well and sometimes both which is really difficult and can really get them at a really low ebb um, everything's harder when we haven't had enough sleep and just as a general rule I would say um, any child that we're worried about or any person that we're worried about who's struggling everything will feel better if we can get their sleep on track if they can get a little bit more a little bit better sleep then things will feel better um, universally applicable advice that um, yourself if you find you're struggling you're at a low ebb actually what can you deprioritize in order to prioritize sleep everything's more manageable then Again, we have on the website, Tom will be proud of me. I've mentioned several courses on the website. We have a, a really good website on the, uh, a really good course on the website about sleep and supporting um, healthy sleep habits, which is put together by Annie O'Neill, who is likely on the call somewhere, but there's so many people here. Um, Annie um, is a school nurse um, and runs a consultancy and provides really good practical strategies for supporting children um, in all sorts of different ways with that amazing school nurse hat on. We love school nurses. Um, and so um, that would be a really good course to, to look at as well for parents or educators or anyone else. This next question, I feel like is a point that we might have to take away and reflect on and maybe make a greater course. But do you have any information about autistic girls in gender dys dysphoria? Uh, OK, so um, it's <laughs> yeah, that's 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 for another day. But what I can tell you is that the incidence of gender dysphoria in autistic girls is remarkably high. Um, and again, that's another reason why, you know, when I said before, so we're talking about autism in girls and autism in boys, but sometimes, you know, you see autistic girls who present like males and vice versa. And actually, there's this really messy bit in the middle um, because the incidence of gender dysphoria in the autistic population is, is high. I read a statistic. Um, yesterday when I was preparing for this course that suggested one in four autistic girls um, uh, experience gender dysphoria but uh, I don't I don't know how like I don't know if that's true that feels far too high surely but it's high we know it's high um, yeah there's a really high instance um, and 
there are you know lots of questions around sort of gender sexuality um those sorts of issues we would i think that's it, it's it that's a big big topic to start going into but i think it's important just the one thing i would say on this um is that um it, for girls um in particular questions around gender and also puberty is really hard like puberty hitting puberty for girls managing periods actually again that's another thing which is de dealt with really really well in this book is how to do puberty as an autistic girl um it's it's it can be a really challenging time um and that, yeah those things are hard and what we the, the key thing we need to do is that adults in an autistic girl's life really is to help her begin to be curious about herself to begin to feel comfortable in who she he they are um and to try and create that safe environment where they can begin to explore this in whatever way feels comfortable um for them and, and just to yeah just to be be curious and be interested in in them um and to to try and allow them to kind of find their feet find themselves in this very interesting world we find ourselves in so there's a question that's been uh, requested by other people to be read out um you said your treatment for anorexia changed once they treated you as autistic in what way did it change we seem to be seeing an increase in eating disorders yeah so um so how did it change? Well, if you're interested, again, if you can make a note of this, Sophie, and add it to the notes, if you're interested in uh, the, the pathway, so we're developing this clinical pathway um, for treating comorbid anorexia and autism, and there's some really good practice already that's come out of this uh, work, which I'm, I've been working on with the Maudsley. I say that like I, I I have a very small part in this. I just sit on the on the expert reference group and occasionally do training with them. But but it's amazing work they're all doing. They publish quite a lot. They've changed quite a lot of practice already. So following them and it's the Peace Pathway, um, and it's it's King's College and and the Maudsley that you'd be looking up. Kate Chanchuria, which is not spelled how you expect. It's T C h a n at the beginning um so look that up i also have a youtube video which is um i spoke at an international conference on this topic recently and i gave sort of five things to understand about the interplay between autism and anorexia but just going to that very specific question around what helped me in that moment so firstly understanding what was autism and what was anorexia so the the kind of the, the crux point for me was that um like many autistic people, I find lots of different flavors and textures of food really overwhelming. Um, and the assumption was that when I was cutting out food groups or finding them too difficult to manage, um, that this was anorexia talking and that I was trying to avoid calories um, and so on and so forth. And actually it was that I just found these things completely overwhelming, um, but in an autistic way rather than an anorexic way. Um, and the tipping point came when I had like many people who suffer any kind of anxiety made my world smaller and smaller and smaller the number of foods i could eat had gone down to one and it was a liquid um food supplement um, and i could only eat it in one flavor or only consume it in one flavor um, and on this day the unit i was on did not have the right flavor um, and this was you know they couldn't see why this was an issue and for me it was completely not possible to have the wrong flavor i couldn't couldn't manage it um and it ended in well i wasn't I'm proud of my behavior it's not a nice day to look back to um and uh, yeah ended up being um force fed and it's horrible it's, i mean yeah it's not nice but um the, at this point you know began to wonder what's actually going on here when we look back on that incident with the view the lens of autism then we understood and my caregivers were able to be a lot more compassionate um but questioning always questioning is this autism or is it anorexia i recently lost my sense of taste and smell um, and found that I was oversensitive to textures that had previously been palatable to me because I didn't have the taste to kind of cover up the textures, I think. And again, I then found myself going to my psychiatrist and saying, how much leeway do I give myself? Because I fall very rapidly into a downward cycle if I begin to restrict my foods. Um, and I, you know, how much leeway do I give myself? Because I'm a bit worried about cutting out food groups. How much of this is actually anorexia pretending to be autism because anorexia is very crafty and how much of it is autism. And we really explored that. So unpicking what is anorexia and what is autism remembering that anorexia is the bully that sits on your shoulder and tries to manipulate and convince everyone including you that you shouldn't be eating shouldn't be consuming that you know this is bad um next thing is that um a starved brain acts quite like an autistic brain so a starved autistic brain means like autism on steroids so i was like became very autistic 
in terms of normally now, if I don't disclose my autism, um, then generally people wouldn't make that assumption about me. Um, and I can I can pass as normal if you like. Um, but uh, it, that there's no way that would have happened when I was um, severely anorexic. My brain was very starved. My thinking became entirely black and white. I was so rigid. I was completely inflexible to any kind of change and deviation. All the, the things you would expect to see in a small autistic boy uh, was how I was behaving. So very, very autistic uh, kind of presentation. Um, and then the final thing um, in terms of how they, they changed it. So I said before about group therapy, I no longer had to do that. And the final thing was that they were more more thoughtful about sensory uh, overstimulation. So in particular, once I moved from group therapy to individualized therapy, um, then I had that individualized therapy in a very calm beige room. Um, and the unit was generally quite busy and loud in terms of you know, noise, but also um, it was beautiful. You know, they made it all pretty and lovely, which was overwhelming, but this room was just plain, just magnolia and, and that was easier, but it had a clock in it. Um, and I found the clock to be really overwhelming and all I could focus on was the clock. Um, and so they removed the clock completely. And then I was able to focus in on the therapy and little things like that, little things make a huge difference if you are overstimulated and noises that might not bother other people but it's all you can hear for me that clock was like the equivalent of your school's fire alarm just going off and going off and going off and going off and trying to dig deep into kind of trauma therapy with that in the background impossible so making adaptations and, and helping me to find those kind of places of calm the other thing was just about just generally I did a lot of learning around my own emotional regulation actually taking my own advice and giving myself space in between um, but yeah it was I you know I'd love to say it was easy and once we had the diagnosis it was all plain sailing it was quite hard work and it's still hard work every day um, but you know it's that's that's life isn't it okay any more for any more I was going to say, should we do one last question and then bring it to a close? Yeah. Um, how would you support an autistic girl with hygiene issues? She doesn't like to wash and only showers once a week. Oh, um, yeah, that's something that we do get asked. Um, I'm trying now to think what was the name of... Oh, it's gone completely. When I tweeted this question out a couple of months ago, there was somebody who came back to me who was like a cosmetic scientist. Like He was literally like he had a PhD in kind of... Yeah, he, he was a chemist, but he had developed a range of um, skincare products um, for, no, they weren't for autistic people, but he found that they were being used a lot by autistic people because they were really neutral. Um, the thing I would be asking basically, so this is a fairly common issue is where I'm going with this. Um, the thing I'd be wondering is what about the, the kind of self-care and, 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 and washing and things is it that are difficult? Because often it's something really simple that's the problem. It might be that shampoos or shower gels are really heavily scented or that the feel of the shower is overwhelming. And so we sometimes just need to find like, really explore it and be curious and instead of going down the route we normally do of well you need to wash come on let's just get on with it actually just providing a safe space for the child to talk about it and explore what about it is it that they're finding difficult and then be curious about different ways forward and you know begin to experiment things that we might try that might be okay and being accepting that they might also not uh, can be helpful but often it will be moving to um yeah unscented products thinking really carefully about what we're actually you know if we're using a poof or a flannel or whatever looking for something that's really sort of soft and acceptable uh to the child for doing that thinking about you know a shower might feel harsh and overwhelming perhaps they would rather have a bath or a kind of standing wash with a flannel the old-fashioned way just just being a little bit yeah being curious um, about it and the other thing is about having some discussions about why do we need to wash and helping them to understand in a stage and age appropriate way the importance of of hygiene um, and exploring together about how we might be able to kind of meet those needs if not in the way that that's currently happening um yeah so as as we come back to all the time be curious explore it together um, and be prepared to get it wrong at first and keep experimenting Brilliant. Um, well, thank you, Pookie, for all that information. <laughs> information overload. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd just like to say that there's been so many people leaving such wonderful comments um, saying how grateful they are for you shedding light on this topic and, you know, talking about it in a different way. Um, so thank you. Um, 
we'll, we'll leave the questions for now and I can see that lots of people are thanking you even more now, now that I've just highlighted <laughs> it um and yeah so I'll um be sending the recording and the notes with bits and pieces afterwards so if anyone else um you know if, if you signed up you will get a copy of the recording it just might take a couple of days to hit your inbox yeah because Sophie has got a life as well haven't you you 